I appreciate so much the invitation to come and to be here again on this lectureship. I think this is one of the highlights of the year to get to come to Texas and to be with the church, to be with this lectureship, and to be associated with Brother Wendell Winkler. I appreciate so much his statement about the papers. There's an old saying that says there's no competition between lighthouses. That should be true of gospel papers. It should be true of our Christian colleges. It should be true of us as preachers and elders and members of the Lord's body. We all ought to be working toward the same end, namely to preach and proclaim the gospel of Christ and to teach people, whether they're young or old, the message of Jesus Christ. So I'm delighted to be here. I was amused and also uh, smiled when I saw the topic that I had as it's listed here in the book. I noticed that it says in listing the various topics and also the various speakers that the topic that I have in the index on page two is difficult Texas from the gospel accounts. I was talking uh, some time uh, back uh, with uh, Brother Franklin Camp, and we were looking at the title that I had. Brother Camp's comment was, he said, huh, Brother Merrill, I knew Texas was old, but I didn't know that it went all the way back to the times of Matthew and the gospel accounts. Those things do happen, and we all understand that. Before I left Tennessee, there was one of the brethren that called me on and told me a story about Texas. He said, now, I know you're going to Texas. And out in Texas, everyone likes to talk about how big Texas is. So he said, I'm going to give you some stories. And he did. And he says, I want you to tell at least some of these stories out there in Texas. One of the stories was there was a man from Texas that went up to the New England states. While he was there, he was visiting around, and his friends were showing him around. The man from Texas always talked about how big everything was in Texas. So the gentleman there in New England went out and found a New England clam, the biggest one they could find. So during the night, they put it in the room with this guy from Texas. And after a while, that thing began to pinch him, and he began to scream and to carry on, caused a big commotion. They turned the lights on. Everyone came in. The man from Texas was over there saying, what in the world is that over there in the bed with me? And the fellows from New England were just laughing and laughing, and they said, why, that's one of the New England bed bugs we have up here. And the Texan looked at that thing, but he wasn't going to be outdone. He just looked over at it and said, huh, small thing, isn't it? <laughs> There's another story about a Texas doctor. There was a Texas doctor that had various patients coming through. There was a patient that came from Alaska, and the patient came in to the Texas doctor in Texas, and the Alaskan patient, he said that he had claustrophobia. Well, the doctor said, how come? What's wrong with you? Why? The man from Alaska said, I'm from Alaska, big state of Alaska, said, I've come down here to Texas, and I want you to know this place is so small, I feel closed in, I can't stand it. But the Texas doctor was not to be outdone. He looked at the fellow and said, huh, from Alaska, huh? After you thaw out down here in Texas, you'll be all right, fella. <laughs> but it is a joy to be here in Texas and to meet and talk with Christian brethren in fellowship and association. I think it's good for preachers to get together, and I enjoy being with other men who try to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a little story along the way I picked up on uh, preachers. It's one on us. The story is there was a little six-year-old girl. She went in one day and complained to her mother and said, Mother, I have a stomachache. Well, her mother said, that's because you haven't eaten anything today. If you'd eat something and put some food in your stomach, then your stomachache would go away. Well, the little six-year-old ate something, and sure enough, the stomachache went away. The next Sunday, they had the preacher over for lunch. He was there at the dinner table, and he complained about his headache. He said, I've got a terrible headache, and I've had a headache all morning. The six-year-old piped up and said, that's because your head is empty. If you had anything in it, then you wouldn't have a headache. <laughs> but I guess in the middle of the afternoon at this time of the day, we need at least a few mental breaks, don't we, in order to stay awake. Now, for the next few minutes, I am to discuss the subject of some difficult text in the book of Matthew, and the texts that have been assigned to me are as follows. 
Matthew 18, 8 says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Also I have Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10. It says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Then I have Matthew 19, 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, committeth adultery. These are the three texts for the next few minutes that we'll be examining and looking at. First of all, in a study of the Bible, one should look at the book that he's studying and something about the context. There is a branch of study known as hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a big word. It simply means the science of interpretation. It is applying common sense to the text of the Bible so that we can understand what is there. There's another word known as exegesis, which means to lead the meaning out of a text so that it can be presented and understood. Exegesis is proper and right. There is another word in the English language, namely eisegesis. Eisegesis means to put a meaning into the text that's not there, that's far into the text. It is proper and right to engage in exegesis. It is wrong, always wrong, to engage in eisegesis. We ought then to lead the meaning out of the text so that we can see it and present it to others. We ought never to put a meaning into the text that's not there in the first place. When you study the book of Matthew, you look first at the writer himself. His name, Matthew Levi, a tax collector. It may well be that he studied business and he was familiar with business practices, business procedures, and the keeping of records. This man, Matthew Levi, was called by the Lord. He was called by the Lord to be an, a disciple, appointed an apostle, a witness of the resurrection, and the author by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of the book that bears his name, the first in the New Testament, namely the book of Matthew. Now, when you read the book of Matthew, you look for a phrase and the phraseology that he uses. Like when you read the book of Mark, the word that's used repeatedly is the word straightway. The Greek word is euthus. It means immediately, straightway. When you read the book of Luke, Luke uses the word certain, a certain one, a certain town. One fellow said when he read Luke, written by Dr. Luke, by the inspiration of the Spirit, it was nice to know a doctor that was certain about something because most doctors assume that it's some kind of virus. When you read the writings of John... You notice the phrase, verily, verily. That's a phrase that's found regularly in the Gospel of John. Now, when you read Matthew, the key phrase is the kingdom of heaven. The idea of the kingdom of heaven, the word kingdom is from Basiliah. The kingdom of heaven is the church. It's the reign of God in the hearts and lives of men and women. It's when we submit our will to Jesus Christ. And Christ through his law, reigns in our heart. Also, when you read the book of Matthew, there is another phrase that you look for, namely, after he had finished these sayings. And when you read the book of Matthew, this actually can serve as an outline for the speeches that are found in the book of Matthew. For example, when you read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, after the sermon... The text says, after he had finished these sayings. Then when you read in Matthew chapter 10, the instruction that Jesus gave to the twelve, at the end of that, after Jesus had finished these sayings. Then you read the seven parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13. After that, you have the phrase, after Jesus had finished these sayings. Then you have the current chapter, Matthew 18, the one that we're looking at. And at the first part of chapter 19, you have the phrase again, after Jesus had finished these sayings. And then the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, after he'd finished these sayings. So not only do you have the key phrase, the kingdom of heaven, 
But you also have the phrase, after he had finished these sayings. So Matthew chapter 18 is in one of these sections of the speeches of the teachings of Jesus Christ that has to do with the character, the disposition that we are to have as his people when the kingdom will be inaugurated and set up. Now, he's, as he does that, in Matthew 18 and verse 8, Jesus says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Wherefore introduces a transition from what had been said to this statement. He says, Wherefore, if thy hand or foot offend thee. The word offend means literally causes you to stumble or entraps you or ensnares you. So if your hand or foot, if it offends you, causes you to stumble, he says, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maim, than having two hands and two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. This is one of those statements that is a double statement in the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, Jesus had made a similar statement. Now here again, he repeats that basic teaching again. You know, repetition, when it's done right, is a marvelous way to learn. And that's the only way we learn a lot of things. I have children. I have one now that's in the third grade, and she's learning the multiplication tables. And you know the only way she's going to learn the multiplication tables is repetition. She just goes over it and over it and over it. I think she's up now somewhere around the nines or something like that. I have uh, two teenage daughters that have already through that. They've learned the multiplication tables. How did they learn them? They learned them by repetition. They went over them and over them and over them. How do we learn basic fundamental principles like this? By repetition, over them and over them again and again. I was in a town, Dunlap, Tennessee, some time back for a gospel meeting. And the brethren there told me that that was an area where T.B. Larimore had preached a lot of sermons up there in a beautiful valley. And one of the stories that one of the older brethren told me was that T.B. Larimore, as the story was told on him, he preached one Sunday morning on repentance. Next Sunday morning, he preached another sermon, and again, it was on repentance. In fact, it was the same sermon. So some of the brethren came up to him and said, Hey, Brother Larimore, you preached that same sermon here last Sunday. Well, he said, There's some people here that need to repent. They hadn't repented yet, and so I decided they ought to hear it again. And so he preached it again. Repetition is the way we learn. Some brethren say, Well, I've heard that story many, many times. Well, you may have heard it many, many times, but it needs to be impressed upon our minds, and there might be something as we go over it that we can learn more about the way we ought to live and to conduct our lives. The fact of the business is, if we get tired of hearing the stories that are in the Bible, and we get tired of hearing the gospel message, there's not something wrong with the message, not something wrong with the preacher, like there's not there's something wrong with us. Now, here in this text, what is Jesus saying? Is the language literal or is it figurative? When you read language, it's obvious that some is literal and some is figurative. Some of the basic figures of speech that we learned in English years ago when we were in school, grammar school, was we learned such things as metaphors and similes. I remember hearing these English teachers talking about metaphors and similes. When I first heard that, I thought, what in the world are they talking about? Well, it's figurative language. A metaphor is where two things are compared. The comparison is understood. A simile is where two things are compared. And it's stated by the words as or like. Figurative language. So that we've studied that in school. When we read the Bible, we see figurative language. The question is, is this literal or figurative? It is not literal language. Jesus is not saying that we are to mutilate our bodies, to take off a hand or take off a leg. You could take off a hand or leg and still not be disciplined and still not be submissive to the Lord, literally speaking, that is. What is the Lord saying? By a bold figure of speech, I probably, he is saying, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's a bold, a vivid, figurative expression that simply means that we need to get hold of ourselves and we need to be in control. We need to be disciplined. If we have desires or pleasures 
We need to discipline ourselves so that we are regulated by the law of Christ. And not only are we regulated by the law of Christ, but the law becomes our desire. Our duty becomes our desire. We do what the law of Christ says, and that is our desire to do so. We need then to control our lives. Years ago, I remember there was a lady that came into the office with a secretary. She sat down. Her husband was in the armed services. And she had literally been doing the town. She'd been going around to various bars and places. And she had been in attendance in church some. I never suspected that she was doing such a thing as that. But she just confessed up. And incidentally, that's more than some people will do. She just confessed up and told what she'd done. And then she finally said, what am I going to do? How am I ever going to straighten my life out? Well, all you could do was to tell the lady like that that she's got to get hold of herself, to get in control of her life and to live by the teachings of the New Testament, that that's really the only way that you can be happy. She'd about decided after doing the town for quite a while that that wasn't the route to true happiness, that she was going to have to put away friends that she was going to have to put away desires and she was going to have to be in control and live the way Jesus intended for us to live. That young lady finally did get hold of herself. She saved her life. She saved her family. She saved her marriage. But she went through a hard struggle. Jesus is saying that we have to be in control our, of ourselves and master ourselves, and that's the simple teaching of this text. Second, in verse 10, Jesus said, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. The question comes up about angels and the meaning of the expression, their angels doth always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. The word angel is from the Greek word angelos. It means literally a messenger. Angels are created spirits having intelligence, will, and power. They are, of course, inferior to God, but superior to man in man's present state. Angels are created spirits which carry out God's sovereign will. The work of angels is found many times in the Bible. When you read the Bible, you find many instances of angels and their activities. When you look at the life of Christ, the angels announced his birth. After Jesus successfully resisted the devil, the angels came and ministered unto him. You'll remember at the resurrection, the angels were there and the stone was rolled away. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, there were men there in white apparel and apparently they were angels. When Christ will come back, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you read about angels in the Bible then, there are numerous instances of them. Hebrews 1.14 says, Of angels are not the all ministering spirits sent forth to do service unto the heirs of salvation. It's obvious that we're the heirs of salvation. They render service. How? I don't know how all they render service. Years ago in Free Hardman College, one of the teachers was Brother Debbie Claude Hall. When you went to Brother Hall's class, uh, he was of the old school. He called the roll and you had to stand up. You stood up. Everyone else was sitting. And he'd ask you some question. It might be about anything. And usually by the time he was through, you felt like you were about an inch high and you were not sure you were even an inch high. Brother Hall could take the starch out of people quicker than anyone I ever met. But Brother Hall had his way, and he was on up in years, and as the days went by, all of us, I think, just fell in love with him. We, we felt he was the grandest fellow there was. Brother Hall would sometimes be asked a question that would be difficult, and he'd say, the answer to that question is, I don't know. He said, there are some questions we do not know, and there's no use to try to say that you do know. Angels... Minister to the heirs of salvation. Yes, that's a fact. How do they do it? I don't know how God does it all. 
Is God doing miracles? No. That's taught plainly in the Bible. But angels serve. They serve the heirs of salvation. They serve under God's direction. Sometime back I was uh, preaching a congregation and a fellow that had been having a little trouble. When I relate the story, you can see what kind of all the trouble he was having. He'd been having some trouble. He said he was in the hospital and he said he was there in the bed and there on his pillow popped up an angel. And the angel began to talk to him and carry on a conversation with him. After a while, that angel popped away. He was gone. He asked me, what do you think about that? He says, have you ever had a conversation with an angel? I said, no, I never have. Why he said they're in the Bible, why they're in Acts chapter 8, why the angel told the preacher uh, where to go, why they're in Acts 10, the angel told Cornelius that he was to send for one, and he did. I said, yes, but that was in the first century, in the age of miracles, and the miracles are not going on now, and the Lord's not having angels talking to us. There are those that think that they see angels, and the angels tell them, turn to the right, turn to the left, do this, do that, don't do that. I don't believe that. Angels are not doing that. Do you believe in angels? Yes. you believe they serve the heirs of salvation? Yes. How old do they do it? I don't know how they do it all. In the next world, we can ask them. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. We need to spend our mind and attention seeking to learn the will of God and then to live it. One fellow said, I have more trouble living it than I do learning it, because I can learn it fairly well, but I have a hard time sometimes living by what it says. If we would live the gospel, we'd be doing well, wouldn't we? Rather than engaging in speculations over how many angels can stand on the point of a needle, or in trying to figure out some way that they serve in providence, that they serve, yes, how? We don't know. Now, what about guardian angels? The phrase guardian angel is not in the Bible. It is derived by some from this text. Roman Catholic theologians have it. It's listed when you look at the standard reference books, the dictionaries. It is a position of Roman Catholicism, not stated as an article of faith, but is held by them. But I think H. Leo Bowles was right when he said that a nominational concept, notice that a nominational concept of guardian angels is fraught with many difficulties, and it's best to avoid such a thing. Lipscomb and Sewell in their questions and answers come out with the same conclusion that the denominational concept of guardian angels is fraught with many difficulties, cannot be substantiated nor proved. That there are angels, yes. That there are many angels that carry out God's will, yes. But how they do it and what they do, we just don't know. In Luke 16, we have about a man that was righteous that died, and he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. Angels must do many, many marvelous and wonderful things in the service of God, and we should be content with reading the text of the Bible and answering the questions that are there. The third text that I'm to deal with is Matthew 19, 9. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and marry another. Whosoever shall marry her that is put away, doth commit adultery. There is a... This passage is one that we need to read carefully, And we need to preach to our people so that they can understand it. And we need to teach it to young people so they'll know the truth on the subject of marriage and how important marriage is so that they'll work hard to have a successful marriage and a successful home. I'll tell you, of all the problems that we face today, and there are many, this problem of divorce, people are divorcing all over the country. And there's scarcely a family, and I dare say that in this auditorium, there's scarcely a family, even in this auditorium, that's not been affected, perhaps even closely affected, with a problem of divorce. It's a real problem. The question that I have, does pornia include homosexuality? The answer, my answer to that is yes. As one fellow says, it won't take me long to answer the question, and I could answer it on a postage card, and it wouldn't. And I'll have still room left over to tell you some other things. Pornia is the Greek word, fornication. It is defined by Arden and Gingrich in their Greek English lexicon to mean all sexual impurity so that it would be the sexual sin between married people or unmarried people. It would include homosexuality. It would include bestiality, as obnoxious as all that is. Now, we have children, and a better world begins with each one of us. We just say, I'm going to be better and do better, and I'm going to do what I can in my family and the people I know to make this a better world. 
So we need to start with our families. I have daughters and I have one son. When the, the son's the last one, so he has four older sisters. I told my wife, I said, I don't want to make a sissy out of this boy. I don't want to see this boy grow up to be a sissy. I said, now, it's all right if they're going to dress him up sometimes and put high heels on him sometimes and uh, hang a purse around his arm sometimes. But if he starts acting like a sissy, now, that's we're going to draw a line. We're just not going to have that. I want my girls dressed up as girls. I want them to have their ribbons and their curls and their high heels and all of that. And I think that's marvelous and great. And I want the boy to be a boy. So he has trains and trucks and little cap guns, and he is a boy. He's all boy. And the way this thing begins is in the home where we train our young girls to be girls and our boys to be boys. Now, I know that there are some, and some in our educational system, that want this unisex idea. They're saturated with humanism, and they say, well, oh, don't make all this big to do about boys here and girls there. Just kind of blend them all together. They're trying to get clothes where you can't tell the difference between a boy and a girl. They're trying to get toys where they use them for either a boy or a girl. They want to do everything. So it's, it's either the boy and the girl. You can't tell the difference. Well, I plan on there being a difference in my family. There's going to be a difference between the girls. There's a difference between girls and a difference between boys. And that distinction needs to be pointed out. They are different. The way God set it up in marriage is for a man and a woman. Uh, some years ago in Scarrett and Vanderbilt uh, colleges, in a, in a class, we were sitting around talking. That's the way they're doing some of these classes, sit around and talk about marriage. There were some people there that actually favored homosexuality. Well, I was shocked. Now, I'm from the country. Now, that's the first time I can recall anybody ever endorsing such a thing. Out in the country, if they had homosexuals, the soldiers would come in and beat them up on Saturday night. That's how they got their practice, I guess, was beating up homosexuals on Saturday night. So I wasn't used to anybody coming out and saying they were for something like it. So they were going around the room, and finally they were coming around to me. I wanted to know, what in the world am I going to say? Because I can't buy that. When it came my time, I said, well, what I do is go back to Genesis, when God started everything. And in the beginning, God made the man, and he made the woman. He didn't make two men, and he didn't make two women. He made a man and woman and that's the way God set it up. And that's the way marriage is supposed to be. Incidentally, it takes three to get married. Always three. One lady said she only thought it talk, took two. That is, a willing girl and a willing mother. And they could get anybody married. But, I, <laughs> but actually, actually, it takes three to get married. There's God, there's the man, and there's woman. It always takes three to get married. And in order for the man and woman to be married... Scripturally, in the sight of God, it must be pleasing and acceptable to God. It always takes three. Pornia means all sexual impurity. God did not intend for a man to be married to a woman and this woman be immoral and live an immoral life. God did not intend for it to be that way. So God set it up. He said, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. And the word except literally means if and only if. That is a grounds for divorce and remarriage. God did not intend for a woman to have to be married to a man that always committed sin. Committed immorality. God did not intend for a woman to have to be married to a man that's a homosexual. In one of our schools, and I say it sadly, it happens in various areas, but in one of our schools, a teacher turned out to be a homosexual. He had a wife and children. Finally, when it all came out and things like that usually finally come out, when things, when it finally came out, he left that town, went to another town. Now, to beat it all, brethren, he shows up at a church in Memphis with his, quote, boyfriend. And they'll sit in the back and listen to some sermons. So now that's not as far away as you might think. Are we going to have such things of homosexuality being condoned? A man on television in Nashville, Tennessee, said he thought that it's the abuse of homosexuality that's condemned, not homosexuality itself. Now, we're not trying to stop anybody from coming to church, obviously. But when they do come to church, we need to make sure we teach them that homosexuality is a sin. It is wrong. Lesbianism is a sin. It is wrong. And we need to start with our children and train them, the boys to be boys and act like boys and the girls to be girls and to act like girls. 
and to have the decency that Christian young people ought to have so that marriage can be a happy and wonderful thing. One man said, I didn't know what happiness was till I got married. Then he said, it was too late. I hope that doesn't describe your marriage. Someone else said that marriage is the institution whereby a man loses his bachelor's degree and wherein a woman earns her master's degree. 